Today's guest is so fantastically important for what we're looking at doing in professional sales today because Minter Dial is actually an expert on leadership. He's also a speaker consultant on other topics like digital transformation and branding, but, but sales leadership is really the X factor of professional sales as many of you have heard of say, say many a time. So that's why we're so excited to have Minter join us here today. And he's gonna be talking to us about his book, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And team, this topic absolutely resonates with me for, for lots of different reasons, but mainly, certainly early in my career, I was not an authentic leader. I think there's lots of salespeople out there I've been working with maybe 20 years ago where, where I wasn't quite as comfortable being my true self at the office. And I think this is really what we're going to push on a little bit here with Minter today. Now, Minter is an award-winning author. His first, he's written multiple books. His first book, The Last Ring Home, was an amazing story about his granddad as a prisoner of war in World War II. And the book was so successful, he actually turned it into a documentary that was aired nationally on PBS. His next book, Future Proof, spoke to 12 disruptive forces out in the marketplace and gave folks strategies for leveraging those for a better future. Then artificial empathy, putting your heart into business and artificial intelligence it actually won the book Excellence Award in 2019. So he's got a wonderful history here in terms of the books that he put out. And by the way, this is well on the path in my view as well. This is one of the best books I've personally read on leadership. I'd encourage everybody to go out and get this book. We're gonna to talk to Mentor about a few things here today. Um, in addition, on the phone, by the way, Minter is a deadhead. So he actually has been following the Grateful Dead for years. And in the book, references how Jerry Garcia, the leader of the Grateful Dead, was actually an introvert and led from the center. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit and push a little bit about that. I think um, there's nobody more credible than Minter in terms of future proof and what's, what's taking place, almost a little bit of a futurist. He started podcasting in 2010, think of that. He's completed 500, almost 500 podcasts, 440 or 450. And the podcast is called Mentor Dialogue. And I really encourage you to start listening to these. I've enjoyed them preparing for today. I think, I, I think he's got up to 440, but it's on leadership and branding, all of these things, digital transformation, all of these things that are very relevant for us today. Now, so Minter appears to be almost the world's most interesting man. There's, there's nothing about Minter so far that I can't say I love with one minor exception. He is a hockey fan. Love that. He loves the Broad Street Bullies. So his team's the Philadelphia Flyers, and he became a fan of the Flyers in their heyday of the Broad Street Bullies in the 1970s. So it's good to know for all of us, nobody's perfect. And clearly, team, again, my apologies for today, those on the live webinar. Nobody's perfect in terms of setting things up. I put our whole team on the wrong webinar. We were doing the webinar for 10 minutes before seeing you here today, but we'll turn that all around now. Minter, if, there, if you're out there, sir, we'd love to have you join. Turn on the camera and join, and welcome to our show here today. Hi, I, my knee, my my video needs to be uh, started somehow. Okay, thank you, Minter. I, I am I'm here though. I'm here. I'm. You can hear me, right? We, I can hear you absolutely. So good morning. Thank you for joining, and and apologies for making this more challenging on you than it needs to be. Well, all good. I'm happy to roll. I, you know, digital world is always full of hiccups and and bugs and and hassles. So. If you haven't learned to be flexible and uh, and to work with it, then you will have a problem. And kudos for you to owning up and taking responsibility for the issues, because that's also about that's a vulnerable thing to say and uh, appreciate it. Well, thank you, Minter. Now, Brendan, if you're out there, my friend, I think there I've done it. There's Minter. Wow. Okay. I actually made this happen. So, so team, thank you so much. And those of you on the webinar live, thank you for joining. Please leverage the chat feature. We have another, the same great teammates who saved me from the error I made this morning, Brendan and Sandra. They'll be tracking through the chat feature and the questions. 
so you can pass your direct questions on to Minter. But Minter, it's so good to see you and thank you for joining and my apologies once again. Uh, Jerry, Jerry and I salute you. <laughs> now I'm, I'm a closet drummer. I played in bar bands during college and university. Maybe nice. we need to get the band back together here. That's it. We'll save that topic for another time. So, so Minter, just as a starting point, there's so many things in, uh, that I'm, I'm really looking forward to unpacking here today. But, but maybe the first one is if we take a look at what's taking place in professional sales, kind of an interesting um, perfect storm in some ways. So first of all, the whole business discipline is exploding. So right now, if you graduate college or university today, there's a 50% chance you're going to be in a professional sales job by the end of your time. In addition to that, um, what we've got today is about half the people in professional sales in the U.S., you know, one in nine people at least in a professional sales job in Canada, uh, but 1.2 million, 1.3 million right now. So a lot of people in professional sales, and that excludes people who sell for a living, but don't have sales in their title. So entrepreneurs, lawyers, consultants, you know, professional services folks. So thinking of those things, everybody's in professional sales, but the stats tell us today that if you're in professional sales, one in three churn jobs every year. And at a sales leader level, if you're a manager of people, your tenure is actually less than two years. So there's this incredible amount of change taking place in professional sales. And a lot of this churn and, and short tenures, they're based because of, uh, in some cases, what would be viewed as lack of performance. It's a really, really tough job if you're a sales leader today. Let's maybe start there. So if I'm taking over perhaps an underperforming sales team today as a new leader, and I wanna to start to kind of absorb and apply some of the key learnings of you, Lee, where would I start? Right, so if you will, Mark, the, the real start actually needs to begin before you join because the fundamental principle within you lead is actually about you leading you. And in order for you to be a good leader, you actually have to do some pre-work, if you will, which will entail a good deal of self-awareness. Sure, so having self-love, mm -hmm. but also understanding what you're all about and understanding what are your foibles, your imperfections, your vulnerabilities, and coming to grips with them. Then right afterwards, you know, depending on, on, on what it is and, and how far you want to go, because I certainly don't want to preach laying everything out and being 100% transparent. But from the starting point, you need to be fully on board with who you are and who you want to be. Because until you've come to grips with your imperfections and your challenges, your foibles, these will come out in unforeseen and undesirable manners in the way you lead. And if you can also understand why you're joining this organization and you can tap into something that isn't just professional, but is personal, then you're on solid base to really figure out how to lead throughout the team. Because in the end of the day, what you want is you want a sales team that has energy, that has confidence and that believes. And, and at some level, if they are able to feel that what they're doing is meaningful and contributes, not just to the company, but to them as individuals, then they're gonna be able to tap into discretionary energy at such a higher level than the competitors. And it's when you know why you're doing what you're doing that all the hard work, the hassles, the, the traffic jams, the you know, parking tickets you have to deal with when you're on the road, well, you manage them, you deal with them because you know why you're doing what you're doing. So as a sales manager, what you wanna do, assuming you've done that pre-work, is to spend the first really uh, you know, good amount of time, depending on how big the team is, on figuring out what, is the real intrinsic motivator for each of the members of your team. Who are the players 
and who want to feel that they can contribute longer term. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then you have to model the behavior, of course, that you want them to follow going forward. So if you screw up, you admit it. If you, if you need help, you ask for it. Because we, we, a lot of times, especially in my generation, we're brought up to think that we know everything. Right. And, right. And, you know, and well, bravado. And I've always got energy. I'm never weak. I'm a tough guy. I played hockey, you know, or I played rugby in my case. But um, if you, if you want to gain that trust within the team, you need to show that you are not perfect. That's the starting point. Well, you know, I I had so much um, self-reflection when I was reading your book, Minter, because I think if I'm being really honest with myself, I think I still struggle with many of these things. I shared this with our team yesterday because there was one thing in the corporate world. And then when you got to a certain level, you felt finally comfortable that, hey, I'm in a position where, quote unquote, I really can't be hurt too much anymore. Things have worked out okay. But as an entrepreneur, when we started in the funnel seven or eight years ago, we start because we're good at kind of one thing. We're good at helping mid-sized sale organizations scale. But there's so many things associated with being an entrepreneur that we're not good at. So, so we're not particularly great at a social media strategy. I don't love, you know, I've got the background, but I don't love doing accounting. I'm not spectacularly good at all. so many different things. And I think at times when you've got a team looking for direction, you want to default to almost convince them you know what you're doing, when in many cases, we don't. Today's webinar is kind of a good example of that. Although in your book, you say, hey, listen, everybody's got to have a certain level of digital savvy. The the other thing I will share, Minter, just to throw it out there in terms of trying to be more authentic, you talked about being okay that you're not perfect. And I I think there comes a time of maturity You know, I'm north of 50 today. So there's maturity where I start to feel okay with my foibles. I certainly didn't feel that way in my 20s. And I didn't feel it nearly as comfortable sharing my personal life into my professional because I wanted the professional to be perfect. And frankly, my personal was a bit of a mess. Young, liked to party a little bit too much. You know, there were there was the odd hangover, perhaps if uh, if I'm remembering things clearly. So I, it felt like I was trying to hide that because I didn't want to get called out as an imposter. And and so I think that's something maybe that a, a lot of us struggled with. And by the way, I think the whole environment promoted that. You know, well, I had to dress the suit. You had to look perfect. Everything had to be great. You had to have that attitude of everything is working perfectly. It just didn't, it didn't seem then like it was a comfortable environment to share what was going on. Hopefully we're in a bit of a different world now, particularly because of what's taken place over the last 18 months. I'm hoping that the founders and leaders out there are a little more comfortable engaging their teams more openly and making sure the teams are comfortable sharing. Your thoughts? Well, so, Sales has a, a, a kind of a particularly bad rap at some level. Yes. And, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, métier or professions that we trust, the most sales often comes at the very bottom. And, and at some level, we continue to be in this push mentality. That's where the rubber hits the road. It's where we get the numbers. We need buddy sales, short-term mentality, push, 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 scream harder, get the sales in. And, and running sales through numbers uh, is a shortcut to disaster because especially in B2B, it's actually all about relationships and trust, God forbid, this mm-hmm. soft stuff. The other thing about sales is that, as you were saying, it tends to lead, we are brought up in an environment of comparison. How am I doing compared to Joe? Uh, Joanne is doing more of this. And, and, and the way managers will do it, like, well, you know what, Mark, you know, you could really do better on your uh, conversions or, you know, yeah. your opening package, Mark, really, you know, look at John. I mean, he's really great. And so you end up in, in this obligatory mode of, of spinning wheels. And what you forget to do is to figure out who you are. Yeah. And, and, and in sales, the, the, at some level, I mentioned the word confidence. You need to feel confident about who you are. 
and 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 the, the strength of that confidence comes when you are also able to deal with your weaknesses your imperfections and, and it's when you've dealt with that then you come up with the singular most important skill that any b2b or anybody actually needs and that's the ability to listen mm. Because it's when you know who you are, you are present with yourself, you're not hiding parts of you, your past and your foibles in some black closet. You are fully present, you recognize you have a wobble, but you're not worried about that. Because if you are, then you can't possibly be listening perfectly to the person who's expressing themselves and you know, understanding their emotions, what their real needs and wants are, and all the other things that go into sales. All you're doing is you're being hit on the head with, you've got to get this number in. And well, if, and then I've got other issues with who I am. So I'm just going to start being a motor mouth. Next thing you know, you're just speaking and you're not listening. Right. It, there is so much. We coach, um, mentor, lots of salespeople side by each, even digitally and trying to listen what they take place. And we try to make them comfortable and add humor to it so everybody's in a good, good situation. But it's really the same, the same philosophy you're sharing about truly understanding the employee, you know, as a leader, trying to understand the employee, their needs and their wants and their goals and their objectives. That's really all professional sales is. You know, at the end of the day, we're trying to understand the buyer their needs, wants, goals, objectives, what they're trying to accomplish, both personally and professionally, because people make decisions emotionally. And it's about listening. Because when you start that sales call, you already know everything you know about you and your products and services. And nobody buys a product or a service. They buy what it might eventually do for them in the future. This seems to be this key thing that's tough to get across to salespeople because a good portion of the time on a call, they're in a bit of a panic. They're in a mild state of anxiety. So that's where, where the talking comes in. So as we keep um, kind of pushing on this authentic leadership, and I love this idea of understanding what's important to you. And I think in a certain, certain regard, you referenced that as finding your North Star, you know, within the book, which I think is so important for people. I think those of us who, you know, had a little bit of a career with tenure, you had those leaders that made everything about you. And they knew your personal situation. They knew what, what triggers, you know, what levers to pull that engaged you. And, and by the way, they didn't all, always have to be warm and cuddly. Um, they were direct and firm. I love the way you approached that. But they were, they were empathetic, which meant they, they understood where you were coming from. They didn't have to just be warm and cuddly, but they understood where you, where you were coming from. So as a leader goes along this journey and starts the, the inward view first, why am I taking the job? What's my true north? Where do they go? For, how do I work with my team to understand their true norths? Where do we then go in terms of trying to lead the team you know, to untap that discretionary energy? Boy, do I love that term in your book. The discretionary energy, how do because we want that engaged team. And I'll I'll share after, I'll share some examples where we've seen that. But how do they do that? Where what's next along our journey as a new sales leader? All right. Well, of course, when you come in, there's always different contexts. You know, you could be in in the in the you know a shitty, fiery situation, or you could be you know, uh, taking over from somebody who was corrupt or brilliant, or you know, there's so many different situations you come into. But and the, the work on the north is hard to jump in at right away okay. because it, it really doesn't require to get into personal matters. So my feeling is you just got to go out there and listen. Yeah. And, and uh, here's a, an exercise that I, I like to do. I do it with senior executive teams because I think this idea of empathy and listening is actually critical for everything because as much as we're talking about sales b2b sales where relationships are critical actually relationships is life yeah. how we connect with people is everything right. like how we talk to a stranger on the street how we 
we we are, are are generous and gracious to the cashier who's got the shitty you know low end job when we when we're just it doesn't take much to say thank you how we are with our spouses who we've been with for many years and we're cutting them off from letting letting them finish what they actually want to say because we think we know what they want to say how are we listening to our child this hey papa i need you are are we there and and how often we are not there so all that to sort of say you know these are situations and these are life skills also particularly useful in relationship management in business and i i uh, I, I i do a thing called empathy circles so an empathy circle you some i, I wonder if someone has heard about this in, in in the in the chat put it away put it in but an empathy circle is a, essentially a structured dialogue and and it, it's fantastically useful as a tool with your team to practice it together because it 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 encourages you to be real and personal and and basically it, you you get a topic you mm. and you you go around for two hours in a structured manner where for five minutes and let's say i'm speaking to you mark i will speak to you about the topic for five minutes and your goal is uniquely to reformulate back without judgment what i've just told you without any judgment just what you heard so at the beginning you've you're coming in with already lots of things you want to talk about this topic you've got bings and bangs you just came from a, a heated conversation with somebody you know you've got 15 emails to do right after the call you have to clear the space and then zone in and listen to mentor for five minutes reformulating everything and by the way you're doing this in public hmm. and and it's remarkable a how bad we are at listening and this is a great way as a team to recognize how we could all improve in our listening it also has a second benefit of connecting it to each other because what better thing than to be heard Salespeople go out there and and they're trying to be heard but actually at a deeper level they're rarely heard just go out there mark you know you've got it you've got this come on push 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 and and if you complain you're whinging and so depending on the culture that you have and feedback loops so an empathy circle is a really interesting this is not something i invented edwin rutch and, and lead of a Niesink came up with it and I, I've done this with senior executive teams with conflict resolution, and it's it's a remarkable tool that anybody can do. It's always useful to have somebody to lead you into it, to get it, you know, figure out the process. But that's a that's a second thing. So in the listening, go out there and just get to understand the business. I I have a nice uh, funny story about my arrival in Montreal. So I'm taking I'm head of the professional division for L'Oreal, for Canada. And the very first day, I said, I want to go out and do some listening. And so I'll never forget this particular trip. So it's in Montreal. It's in the winter. And um, I go out there. And I, my sales manager, Jean-Pierre, had given me a little flag, uh, a maple leaf flag. He put it on my, I put it on my lapel. And I thought, well, between my English, American, and French heritage, which is sort of who I am from the background, I felt like I, you know, I'd be fitting in. Boy, did I get it wrong. <laughs> the first client we received was a major important client. He announced to me in French, and then I'll translate, Mais monsieur, c'est un peu tôt pour montrer vos couleurs. Mister, it's a bit quick to show your colors. In other words, Minter had not done his homework as to the politics, the context of Montreal. And of course, I was very upset at my sales manager for not having done that. But the point, or my, I mean, really, so I'm showing my imperfections, but mm -hmm. also the intention was to go out there and listen, to find out what's going on, to talk to the sales manager for a day in the car, because, you know, you're driving around in the cold, you better stay in the car, you're not going to just idly walk around. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so that you get to listen and, and maybe even bring in an empathy circle if listening is something that's really, you know, you're keyed up on. Well, it's funny you say the, the empathy circle, 
Um, there's a children's game called Broken Telephone, which is fundamentally the same thing, where the children go around a room, somebody starts with a story, and they whisper it to each other around the room, and by the end, you see what the, the new story has become. And so that, that active listening, the way we position it, mentor, when we're training salespeople is, we find that when they're in the middle of a conversation, particularly when they're new, they're, they're, because there's a level of anxiety, they actually can't hear what somebody else is saying because their brain is over here trying to figure out, where do I go from here? What am I gonna ask next? And so we try and what we try to help with is say, listen, let's help you with a bit of a process to guide a conversation if you get in trouble. But you have to be in the conversation. You have to be in the conversation. By the way, this, this visit in Montreal, what year was that? That was 2003. 2003. So at the beginning when I, uh, the introduction, because it was the second time I've done it in, in 10 minutes, I neglected to mention to him that, you know, Minter's last significant corporate role was as the leader of Redkin, you know, globally, L'Oreal's Redkin globally based in New York City. So he'd done that, he performed that role for 16 years and the book's chock full of such interesting references in terms of how he engaged that team to get all of their discretionary energy. But boy, if, if all of us as leaders and salespeople took nothing else from today, except for two things in terms of what you just said, uh, the power of listening and also the power of gratitude, a please, a thank you with your spouses, with your teammates, with your friends, with your clients, you know, who engage us in a conversation and share a little bit about what's taking place with the business. Just a calm pause and a thank you so much for sharing that. Boy, I, if, that go long I'm, I'm going to, so obviously, you know, about my... Um, <laughs> Jerry. You no, know, grateful dad, right? And uh, that's not by mistake at some level. But here's the thing anyone who's listening can do, and it's just a remarkable little exercise that you can bring into your lives in general. Take out your telephone. And, to, and think of somebody you haven't spoken to in a while, but you have been thankful. They've done something for you in the past and you just didn't do it. Just send them a message, a short, hey, listen, you know, Joe, I'm just thinking of you, this stupid guy, Minter, said to send me a message. Um, I wanted to thank you. Be specific. So I wanted to thank you, Joe, for the time where you helped me out. You, you answered the call at two in the morning. You, you replied to an email. You helped me brainstorm on an idea, whatever it is. And, and just send a message and see what happens. Because when you are grateful, what's absolutely beautiful about it is that it brings back energy to you. Oh, boy, does it ever. Boy, Minter, does it ever. And, and um, I'm sure I don't do nearly enough of that, but each and every time I just feel so much better about me when I get a chance to do that. And boy, does it ever change someone's disposition, the power. I love to hear a thank you. Too, I'm, I'm no different from, from anybody else. I just love to of course. hear it. So all of this, and, and I love the fact you've got, we're gonna have to get to the Grateful Dead a little more in terms of you know, leading from the center, but when you speak, the, the reference you end up making to the Grateful Dead, and correct me if I'm wrong, I loved how it started with you know, this, this challenge that we as sales leaders, when we're developing the strategy, trying to develop a vision for the business, is it customer first, is it employee first? And I love this discussion around this employee first mentality leads to customer centricity. Can we un unwrap that topic a little bit, Minter? Right, well, so it's, it's, there's a bunch to it, but let's say a lot of companies have all of a sudden said, oh my gosh, customer is important. Uh, it's ironic, I say it with tone like that, but in fact, more than 50% of companies now have put customer experience as number one of the top three strategic imperatives. So everybody's talking about it. That's good. Of course, very few are doing it, but they're talking about it because they still have to figure they're they're still kind of actually stuck on making profit and, and being successful, surviving, like the word you used before. Right, right now, uh, the people are focused on customer, but the issue is now. As opposed to before, there's so many more different points of contact that go into making the customer experience that it's actually the employees that are delivering the customer delight. It, it wasn't always this way. 
because in the past we you, you basically had a little bit more channeling one way conversations but now with the internet which has made and, and with the mushroom of different technologies we've got so many different ways to to connect and so you have more people in the company participating in making your customers successful so you as a salesperson need to be thinking about your relationships with all the people within the company by the way you know, who's helping you out in customer care? Who's helping you out in logistics? Because these people are delivering the products to make your customers happy. Who's right. on social media answering the customer issues and so on and so forth. So you, you, you're a team now delivering. So as the head of the company, your goal needs to be thinking about how to motivate, mobilize your employees above and beyond what other companies are doing. Because other companies are now on this customer excellence customer service story. So your goal is to figure out what mobilizes your employees. And the thing that I like to focus on there is, and I call it the inside out model, you need to make sure that your employees are your number one fans. I, I, um, the, the model or the, the, the sort of, let's say, jest is how many of you guys would like to have a tattoo of the company you're working for you on your skin. And, and forget about whether you like tattoos, but would you want, as a CEO, as a sales leader, small or big or medium-sized company, whatever, would you get a tattoo of the company that you're working for or wow. with? And, and if not, you do need to ask your question, why not? And there are two parts to this. One is, A, do you know what you stand for? Because if you do, there's a better chance you might like to have a piece of the company on it because it, you actually know who you are. Mm -hmm. The second one, and, and far more intangible and difficult, is does the company actually stand for what it says it stands for? And that work, that gap between what you say and what you do is awfully noxious. So your role as a leader is to narrow that gap, make it come alive for the employees so they feel like it's real. So because you're always saying things like, well, we're here to make the world better. Sure. We, we want to you know, have sustainable products. Sure. We also need to be profitable. And, and sometimes we can't. So are you being real about that and, and closing that gap so people believe? Because when you look at these salespeople, they need to have confidence. They have to have trust. And they have to have belief in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, you want them to love the product. So how do you do that? You don't just flood them with product. You need to flood them with the love of the product, the love of the brand, the mission, and what they stand for. Then you can have a tattoo. And the thing behind that, of course, is all about purpose. The stronger you have a big purpose to your company, then the more likely you're going to develop some of that discretionary energy. And I'm going to finish with one last thing, because I know this is a long monologue, Mark. Fantastic. But um, uh, a pharmaceutical company I was working with, um, they, they were talking about their mission, and they said they in their sector, they wanted to have the best uh, products in their sector, uh, best in the world in the sector. And, and then working with another consultant, we changed it to actually, wouldn't it be better if you had the best products for the world mm -hmm. and the point there was to figure out that we're not being competitive but we're actually doing something for the world not trying to be the best we the best in the world which comes back to this part i was mentioning before about numbers in sales we tend to articulate everything around numbers i want to be number one really why well i get the best biggest car why is that important to you what is it about the big car, the big toys, the large house that's important to you? Mm -hmm. And, and if these are extrinsic elements. And, and the fact is, news flash, when you die, you don't take them with you. What you take with you or what you leave behind is your reputation and your legacy. How did you, what are you trying to do to make the world a better place? And in sales, that can oftentimes be complicated because you're not really in, in the master of making, crafting the company's mission statement, but you are making it come alive. So your choice 
as a salesperson, as a sales manager, is to verify the company you're working at. And, and before you go in, do they actually have a purpose that I can jump, that I can deal with, that I can resonate with, that I can help bring into the sales team and make it feel like they are contributing, that it's real to them as well. Because if you're just running on bullshit, authenticity is the issue. They will see it. They have, everybody has now these huge gallon sprays of bullshit detectors, which they can spray as salespeople on their managers and as customers on salespeople. So your role there is to, as a sales manager, is to smooth that gap, break it down, make it come alive and make it real. Minter, there's so many things that resonate with, with what you just said. And maybe you're in the same boat as me where you, you get this privilege of working with so many companies. You do consulting in addition to the speaking and, and the writing and we do consulting. When you, that you referenced in the book, you know, would you brand yourself? Would you tattoo yourself with the brand? We've come across companies that we've been so privileged to work with. And I'll, I'll give one shout out here to a company called Strategic Coach. World, they're the world's largest coaching program for entrepreneurs. And my goodness me, of the 150, 160 people who work there, I have never come across an organization where so buddy so well aligned with the goals, the missions, the raison d'etre for the whole organization. It's unbelievable. And, and I'm firmly convinced that there's probably a few people from Coach on this, this webinar today, the live version. They, they'd be happy to get tattooed. I would say- Well, I'm gonna ask Chantal where. <laughs> oh, just kidding! Just careful, kidding. Careful. Okay, so now my HR is gonna. Okay, we're gonna. Yeah, just yeah too much information. That part comes out of the podcast. Who's ever editing? Upper calf. We heard upper calf. Nice and nice. And very good. Thank you, Chantel. But but what an amazing um, bit of coaching for everybody who's gonna watch it. Who's applying for that next job? Whether you're a sales leader or a salesperson, ask in the interview. You know, why does this company exist? You know, if I want to do better for, if I want a higher purpose, what's the higher purpose of the business? I've been in both types of companies as an employee before we started in the funnel 10 years ago. And some of these, particularly in high-end enterprise sale, um, software sales and so forth, what I found is in lacking that mission, there's bad behaviors that result all over the place, personal bad behaviors, professional bad behaviors, so I really find that, that there's this culture trying to build this mission, this, this set of values. We always like a sales leader, even if the company, you can't control the, the broader company, for your sales team, think about the values you want showcased by the team that you want to work with. I wanna, can I just break in one second, which please, is um, some, sometimes we, we um, can fall victim to the victim idea. Oh, well, that's the way it is in the company. And, uh, and I'm just going to complain about it. And, and the story that I wanted to tell was uh, at, when I was running Redken, it was part of L'Oreal. And so one could easily have just said, well, that's the way it is at L'Oreal. I can't possibly do it at Redken. And, and there was there was certainly lots of challenges. But with uh, this guy, Pat Parenti, a role model and just a, a wonderful man and a deadhead, uh, he and I uh, looked at how to craft a culture with different values and behaviors within the Redken organization while being within L'Oreal. And of course, we had to do it with, an intel with intelligence and we had to do it with ethics. But we, we absolutely materially looked at what we could do to make our mission, our purpose for Redken, come alive with L'Oreal employees who worked for Redken. And, and so the point was, rather than sort of be, feel subjugated to the system you're in, when you have a team, you can have an impact, at the very least, wherever you are in the organization, because obviously this can vary. But why not try to make that happen in your small team, if you're just a manager of five people in a huge organization, because right. you can do it. And maybe this isn't the place you're going to live your life out and tattoo yourself with, but at least practice that, practice being active in taking on board, crafting mission and values and making them come alive in your team. 
you know, when you when you were running Redkin, how many employees overall were you in charge of Mentor? Two thousand. Well, so it's a little complicated because we have very matrixal uh, organization, but two thousand people were working for Redkin. So when you were looking for maybe your um, the first layer down, the second layer down, tell me a little bit about once you'd established your raison d'etre. How did you go about when you were recruiting? What kind of attributes were you looking for and teammates you added to those layers? Well, so when I when I first came on, well, the advantage uh, that had been that I worked within the team previously in the operational team within the United States Redken. So I really knew the, the, the fundamentals, the the, uh, the underpinnings of the brand. So when I came on and took it over at the top level, I, I was really aware that so I didn't actually have as much to learn at some level about what the, what the company stood for. So one of the things we did was that we said, well, we want to make this come alive. Mm-hmm. And Pat and I, uh, with the help of an amazing consultant guy, we, we, um, we got the 100, maybe 130 directors and above to participate in, in figuring out how, as a group, we were going to strategically choose our future. And, and how we were going to strategically reallocate our resources, as well as making our vision and mission come alive, which in, involves so many different factors. And the, the point with Pat was that we were delegating the authority. Rather than impose, like, we know it all, this is what you got to do. Mm-hmm. We onboarded in a three-day session where we didn't know where it was going to finish. Wow. So our commitment was to allow the pros to be following the journey. Uh, as part of that, we, with my team, I, I wanted to make sure I had on board the players who were interested in staying. So we, we wanted to create an environment where they would self-select, I'm in or I'm out. Two people selected themselves to be out. They weren't part of this gig. Mm. And that's the best way. Then afterwards, in terms of recruitment, the, um, the fact is that I'm a big believer in hiring for attitude, not competency. I, I'd rather hire somebody who has no experience in the industry, who maybe doesn't have all the skills ne- necessary and certainly doesn't need all the titles and three letters, you know, uh, insignia after your name. But if they have the right attitude, boy, that's where I, they're on fire. And, and that's, that's how I, I tend to roll. I mean, this take, take the nuances because sometimes you absolutely need to have skilled people with certain uh, business. You know, if you want to do SAP, you can't be a buff, buffoon mm-hmm. on SAP. You got to know what you're doing. But in general, that's my approach. And that was always our approach. But that meant you really need to know what your values are and, and how do those break down into what behaviors, what language you use. Yeah. And are you prepared to be that way? For example, I'm going to give you an example that kind of brings it quite to home. We had a culture at Redkin, not Royal, and also pre-Me Too, of hugging one another for seven seconds. So not that we would do this, like in the immediately in the recruitment, hey, listen, hug me. You know, that, that's not the right thing. Mm-hmm. But we, we wanted that kind of a culture where we were able to hug one another, man to man, woman to woman, and man and woman hugging for seven seconds believe me in a professional space that is a long time seven seconds is forever you know especially when you think about the sort of the americans or tap tap type of hug you know that's Mm. sort of uh, almost a a, a handshake kind of thing but um we would do this and and when you hug for that amount of time you get connected with the individual wow it, it turns out there's studies that show it at 20 seconds that your heartbeats start to beat at the same rate. Wow. So that's talk deep connection. So when you want to join us, you, are, you, are you up for that? You know, oh, no, I, 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 great. I'd rather you know you're not up for that because you can't try to please everybody all the time with everything. Right. Right. And, and that's the other type of mistake we get into. We're trying to get every kind of customer because we don't know who we want to have as the customer. Of course, we have that, you know, I mean, that I should say that sometimes you want to have the big, rich, profitable customer. Sure. But in balance, we don't actually know what we stand for and who we are. 
And if we don't have that work as an organization, as an individual, we kind of run after everything. And by running after everything, we get damn tired because it's really exhausting trying to please everybody all the time everywhere. Right. That's actually both a philosophical issue, I find, and then a strategic issue. Just from a productivity perspective that, you know, you've got to zone in on the perfect client for you that you can win, who actually where your value proposition resonates to that client. So, so I think it's both a philosophical, they're the client you want to work with. And then strategically, it's more efficient because if there's a meeting of the minds, you're going to have a, a higher win rate. They're going to see value in what you bring to the table. It's funny, um, you know, I, that stood out to me in the book as well about the hugging. Um, we, we had one client again, we have so many wonderful clients, by the way. I've, I've mentioned only one here today, but there's so many wonderful ones, but one of them are huggers. And so even for outside consultants coming in, and so that's, that's something you kind of get used to. And then frankly, I'll tell you what, I, I started missing it when it didn't occur. So I'd go to the different offices, Chicago office, and there'd be a lineup of a bunch of people where we just greeted by hugging. And if something happened that day and I didn't get the hug from so-and-so, I think to myself, have I done something wrong? You know, did I offend this person? Started really wanting it. Well, we, we all seek connection. You know, I was talking about relationships. We seek connection. And in today's world, we have run across an existential crisis mm -hmm. where energy levels are low. Connection in a hyper-connected world have never, has never been lower. And, and so this idea of connecting with your team, with yourself, and being real about your own energies, figuring out how to tap into those energies, that's what we need to be doing. And we need to be real. This existential crisis is real. People are deeply worried uh, about their own mortality, why they're on this earth, and can they contribute? Can they, can they do something that's meaningful? So your role is to figure out how to make what they're doing meaningful. Am I contributing? Am I relevant? And, and if you're not looking at those questions and you're just beating the drum of numbers and pushing it down the pipe, you know, maybe you're giving them upskilling them, which is nice, but for the rest, are you tapping into what's important? Hmm. You, you know, you've given um, uh, so much to think about here today, Minter. I mean, frankly, this conversation, I can't believe we're rounding the top of the hour. I'd be happy to chat for another couple of hours, but I'm, I'm sure you've got other things. As we, first of all, I just want to say on behalf of our whole community, thank you. So, so first, just to thank you for this book. I, I'm saying to my team, I wish I'd read this book 18 years ago when I first started taking leadership roles. And I think there'd be a, a whole group of salespeople that would have had a much easier time in the first couple of years when I was learning how to do this. Secondly, thank you so much for coming on our show today. Um, how would of all the people who are going to be watching this live or listening to the podcast, how do they get in contact with you from here? Where should they go? Well, um, go straight to your diary and figure out who you are. That's the most important thing. Should you wish to uh, follow anything I, my crazy little mind likes to get up to? Uh, and if you parle français, I've been podcasting in French, by the way. So I've got about 130 or so episodes en français. It, with the Minter Dialogue, it, it translates nicely into French. I'm thinking in Canada, we might have a few. Um, but otherwise, uh, I have this weird name, which is um, Google friendly, MinterDial.com, where I have a newsletter, which is once every two weeks. And I try to blog and, and, and hopefully write stimulating, moving things somehow. Um, you can also find me on various social programs with uh, monikers like MDial uh, on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and, um, and, and uh, yeah, what I'm trying to do, is really what I'm all about, Mark, is elevating the, the debate and connecting dots, people and ideas. And so uh, hopefully by stimulating our creative spunk, uh, allowing us to maybe listen to some crazy music, have some fun. Uh, you can also tap into your discretionary energies this way and do something that's important. Thank you, Minter, and your best Deadhead show ever. What, what, what show was the favorite Grateful Dead show that you ever saw? Well, I'm going to tell you something. I've saw, I couple, saw them a couple of hundred times, and on the 30th of October, I'm going to go see Phil Lesh 
uh, the bass guitarist for his 80th birthday plus one in New York. And the next day I'm flying to LA to see The Dead & Co with John Mayer for Hollywood Bowl Halloween night last night of their entire oh. awesome tour. So oh, wow. um, I'm, I'm hoping that's going to be the biggest show I get to go to. Um, the best show I ever went to probably um good lore actually I, I have so many my first one was in 1981 in london and uh, there were maybe a couple of hundred people at, at the concert in rainbow theater so i spent the entire show well, of course dancing and having fun <laughs> and and also when i was tired putting my elbows on the stage and just looking up wow that that's a that's a meaningful uh memory as a 17 year old and otherwise um phew, Saratoga Springs, uh, RFK, JFK, um, New, New Haven Coliseum. Oh, you know, I was mostly on the East Coast for most of my shows. Uh, and, um, oh, really, they all, it's just like this, they all, you know, sort of seem to feed into one at some level. And it's just that I, 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 I um, have so much love with my uh, all the people I went to see shows, so I, I'm I'm sorry not to bring another one. I have a I feel sentimental actually. I'm I'm um, just uh, I listen to the Dead every day. I play I play about a half an hour of guitar every day, and I'm always playing one or two songs. But uh, Ripple is is right up there. Well, there's um, uh, on pay TV now right now. There's something called Laurel Canyon that goes back to the days of the heyday of Laurel Canyon when. All the musicians were open. It was a community. They shared their songs and the dead were up there. So the dead, the mamas and papas, Crosby, Steels, Nash and Young, Joni Mitchell, all those folks. What a, what a flourishing, um, vibrant community where they were, the Eagles started up there, just a great group. And it lasted for this sort of perfect period of five or six years where some amazing music came out of there. I just want to finish with one Canadian story, which is, and I can't remember the name of this, but it's a train ride that ha is a train ride and all the concerts that happened in 1970 across Canada. Yes, um, I, I've seen it. You go ahead. I, I, the name will come to me when you're talking about it. I, anyway, there was, there was Janis Joplin, the Grateful Dead, the, the band, and a bunch of other really wacky, and that is just one heck of a documentary to check out. Uh, the, is on the, they're on the train ride um, going across from from Toronto all the way to Vancouver. It was, it was a brilliant uh, experience. They did. The fun thing I like, given some of my past, what they like about that is that's the only time ever we have uh, government um, run liquor in beer stores. They, they opened on a Sunday, a closed liquor store on the way on that train because they ran out of booze. So they right. had to go in, they got some, some senior level bureaucrat to open the thing up and they emptied the place. Right. It was Festival oh, Express. Festival Express was the oh, name of the film. I just Googled it. Great and found documentary it. to watch. That is, it really is fantastic documentary to watch. Mentor, the learning keeps co coming here. Everybody's, now everybody's got something to do on the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a pleasure having you on the show here today. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you. You, you take care. You have a wonderful weekend. Okay. You too.